speak, friend, and enter. It's time for Science, Science. Sci Friday on Skywatch TV. <laughs> Welcome. I'm Tara Gilbert, and joining us in studio, as always, my best friend and the Skywatch TV science editor, Sharon Gilbert. Hi, honey. Hi, sweetheart. Melon. Yes. That's the, the, the Middle Earth name, the, the Elvish word for a friend. We are total geeks. We truly are. <laughs> way too geeky. In fact, your ears are a little bit pointy. They are. I, I always thought, you know, that's why I related so well to Mr. Spock on, on Star Trek. Yeah. That's how I learned to do, do this. Or, oh, yeah, the Spock yeah. Oh, and of course, you know, this has uh, got a, a, actually Jewish significance. It does. And yeah. that's, that actually Nimoy came up with Right, it. right. So, yeah, uh, yeah there's, there's a little backstory to that that most of us don't even, don't even know. We don't know half the things that are going on in the We world. don't even know half the things we talk about on I this program. I don't know. Who, you, who are you again? <laughs> I don't know who <laughs> I am. Well, welcome again to Sci Friday. You know what? We've got lots of stuff to talk about. We've got the longest list yeah. I think we've ever had. And we'll never get we'll through it. We'll never get all. through all of it. No. So let's just dive in and see let's how much do. we can cover. What's the first thing you want to talk about? Well, I thought there was some, as long as we're starting with a, this Star Trek reference, there was a, uh, a, a new engine that uh, NASA has been talking about here for some months. We mentioned it once or twice on the daily news updates. It's uh, what they're calling the M drive or the EM drive. Mm -hmm which is supposedly a fuel-free engine that uh, Electromagnetic the, the, the developers... Drive. Yes. Is that what they're saying? I, I believe so. Um, the, uh, but the idea that this is fuel-free almost makes it sound like a perpetual motion machine, you know, like one of those Rube Goldberg type things that yeah, just... Yeah, but, but it no, perpetual motion means that it doesn't require any outside stimulus. This does because it's using solar energy. Well, it's using it? solar energy to create the, uh, the power uh, and... It, it supposedly, according to the, the designers who've been working on this, creates thrust by bouncing microwaves around inside of a chamber. And they <laughs> claim that it could generate enough power to transport a craft to Mars and in 10 weeks. And they cook a turkey on And cook a turkey in less than 20 minutes, which is really incredible. So, um, but now, many of the uh, scholars have looked at this and engineers have looked at this say that this just cannot possibly work because <laughs> you cannot defy the laws of physics. Um, it supposedly... Uh, well, violates the laws of physics, but there are uh, engineers now and scientists who are going to look at this. It, it's being peer reviewed right now. It is now, going to be peer reviewed. Which may or may not mean it will work. It's just whether or not they believe that it does right. not violate the laws of physics. Right, right. Um, yeah, and peer review is, uh, you know, someone who was part of the academic mm -hmm. uh, community. Yes. When we met, you were working at the uh, IU. I was conducting research. And yes, conducting retool at the uh, School of Optometry for and Indiana University. And they let me do it. That's what's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, you understand that peer review doesn't necessarily mean that something is actually passed some sort of test that no. that, that validates the science. It, precisely. It, it, it simply is having people who are trusted in the field look at the paper, make sure, first of all, that you did your due diligence, that the, the numbers add up, this and that. But it doesn't mean that it will work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there, there are some... Uh, horror stories out there, and I, I don't have the numbers in front of me because I didn't think we'd go here, but uh, that showing that, that even peer-reviewed science, um, that a, a fraction, less than half of the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the uh, experiments that, that make it into peer-reviewed journals are actually uh, replicable. <laughs> so I've seen dachshund scientists, though, and their <laughs> stuff always works. Yeah. Yeah. Or else. <laughs> German engineering. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Uh, we, we could talk about a bunch of things. Well, <clears throat> you've probably talked about this on your, uh, your updates already. But just in case you're not aware of it, there is a 3D printed version of the Gate of Baal yes. from uh, Palmyra that right. is being, it really is being constructed in London. And then later on this year, it'll be constructed in New York City. Right. Uh, what I find interesting about those two cities is that they are connected already. They both have the needle of Cleopatra yeah. in them. The, and this was really interesting. I, I had not made this connection, but I, I think this well, is significant. Well, I'm doing a 19th century thing, so, you know, I'm, I've, London is on my brain all the time. Yeah, um, and, and there have been some claims that have made it into the, uh, the Christian media that, that I think are maybe a little bit, um, say, sensationalist. About the Baal about the, about the Temple of Bell. Yeah, the, okay, this is, again, this is from the, the Temple of Bell, which was built in the first century. Mm -hmm. uh, as we talked about it last week, it... Yeah. Uh, uh, was cre it, it was dedicated in the year 32. So just about the time Jesus was going to the cross, mm -hmm. this temple of Bel or Baal or mm -hmm. Baal was, was being dedicated. Yes. And in Jesus' own words, he links Baal 
to Satan. So we're basically, we're looking at these gates, replicas of the gates that uh, for the temple that was destroyed mm-hmm. by the Islamic State last year, being c- constructed in London and, and in New York. Yeah. And as you point out, these these uh, needles of Cleopatra. Yeah, Cleopatra's needles, yeah. yeah. They, uh, they are uh, obelisks. Right, which of course represents the, uh, the phallus of Osiris. It does, and so you're getting into this idea, if you have a gateway, in many ways, that is the female receptacle, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, needle, the... Uh, 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 Obelisk. Mm-hmm. Sorry, forgot the day. Na- forgot the word. Let me come in again. Uh, that represents the male aspect. Right. And so you've got, well, frankly, the Ghostbusters uh, a combination. Yes. You've got the key master and the gatekeeper. Exactly. <laughs> and, and these these uh, obelisks were removed from uh, the uh, the Egyptian city of Heliopolis, where they were constructed in 1450 B.C. or thereabouts by the uh, Pharaoh Thutmose the Third. Yeah who was considered the greatest conqueror of all of the Egyptian pharaohs. I mean, yeah. Ramses, heh, no, Thutmose, he actually waged war as far north as the uh, Euphrates River hmm. uh, and the, the Battle of Kadesh um, against the, uh, the, uh, the, the kingdom of Mitanni. Well, you're writing a book about all and, this And right I'm getting now. into so some of that really stuff. you're really reading right. up on this. This is kind of new to me. But anyway, uh, this uh, was a patchy, matching pair of obelisks yes. from the city of Heliopolis that goes yeah. back, again, 3,500 years, and they've yeah. been set up one in London, one in New York. And the fact that we're building the gateway, you know, the female aspect yes. to both, that, that, that's yes. a little creepy. There, there's a little more significance yeah. to the it than The reason I right. brought it up in the science uh, update is because it's being done with 3D printing. Yes. 3D printing is all the rage. It's everywhere. It can be used to recreate almost everything. Mm-hmm. And that includes life forms. Yeah. All you need to do is have the correct substrate to print with mm-hmm. and a pattern, and it'll just go to town. Well, we they're s- now printing robots now that once they're done, they walk away. And we've seen stories about how they can uh, uh, print uh, replacement skin or mm-hmm. organs, like yeah, ears. And, exactly, and the, and the belief is that pretty soon, if not already, uh, that scientists will be able to 3D print a- any kind of molecule. That all you need to do is have the formula for the vaccine or the formula for the virus and go to town. Mm. It, it's incredible what, what science is a- it, able to come up with. It's pretty crazy what science comes up with. Yeah. Well, w- one of the things that uh, is actually, well, sounds crazy, but we've actually talked with Chuck Missler about it here on this program within the last uh, you know, six months. Uh, scientists who seriously consider the possibility that we're living inside a hologram. There's been a lot of buzz about that. You and I actually have talked about the sort of kicked around the idea about having another show that we do together. We're going to take over this. <laughs> Another show that we do together where we actually are looking at the memes in media, yeah. where television, fiction, um, video games, graphic novels, news uh, reports, movies, yeah. news reports, any type of, of uh, information that you consume, whether it's entertainment, infotainment, or strict you know, information, uh, what is it we're tr- being taught to believe? Right. And uh, I think this is something that really is disturbing that we're seeing this meme over and over again. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chuck talked about it when he was here. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, it, it is possible that because when you when you realize that um, the the fabric of of reality mm-hmm. and this and this is the type of thing that Josh and Christina Peck talk about on their program into the multiverse and, and um, that. Uh, 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 Chuck has been talking about yes, for years. Yes, and yeah. Chuck has been talking about And you can find some of his teachings online at khouse.org, uh, the Koinonia House website, that uh, the, the very building blocks of reality, uh, units of time, um, subatomic particles, y- you can theoretically slice something in half and, and continue slicing it in yeah. half I forever. Item. Yeah. But, you, but you find out that uh, when you get down to a certain uh, point, the, the Planck uh, constant. Mm-hmm. Um, you can no longer divide that unit of space or that unit of time any further. Yeah. You've gone as far as you can go. Mm-hmm. And it is like the digital uh, basis upon which everything is is created. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, scientists are, are seriously uh, discussing this. In fact, this past Tuesday at the uh, American Museum of Natural History in yeah. New York, um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who um, hosted that 
short-lived uh, mm -hmm. reboot of the, the Cosmos television yeah. program recently. Um, but he was joined by a theoretical physicist from Harvard, a cosmologist from MIT, professor of philo philosophy from New York University, theoretical physicist from MIT, uh -huh. theoretical physicist from University of Maryland. I mean, these are not... These this are not was a cranks. Serious a discussion. serious discussion. And right. their conclusion was? Well, uh, it depended on who you asked. Um, they asked the scientist, what is the percentage, how likely is it that the universe is actually a simulation? Um, uh, the, the theoretical physicist, uh, Lisa Randall, she said 0% chance. Um, the, oh, she uh, was programmed to say that. Yeah, the, prof the professor <laughs> of philosophy said, and this was the interesting answer, uh, the professor of philosophy I, I think had the most intelligent answer. Even if we were inside a simulation, we wouldn't know because the evidence that we can perceive would also would be part it of the would simulation. All be simulated That's exactly. Right. I, I I agree with that. I think another one. I think it said seventeen percent. Seventeen percent. Right. Come yeah. Come up with that. Yeah. I, I have no clue. Pull it out of his. You know, yeah, out of the air. Out of the air. Yeah. yeah. But we as Christians understand that even though you can make the case that it is a. Uh, simulation. It is reality. Mm -hmm. God created us to live inside this, this physical realm, uh, but that someday we will be able to perceive the you know, reality in its entirety. Yeah. And Truth Chuck, is so much larger right, than we can perceive. Right. We're living inside a greater reality that yeah. we only can perceive in part. Yeah. We're re living inside a bubble, you might say. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, there's a story that I want to talk about, and it gets back to this idea of studying the brain. And we've said many times on this show that the whole brain initiative and the European version of it, that these are intended not only to help, <clears throat> excuse me, learn about human neuroanatomy and physiology to better understand it, to create drugs that mm -hmm. will help to make lots of money, to be honest with you, but also to help design new computers. There's an interesting... <clears throat> new study that came out about anti-memories. 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 Huh. Isn't that interesting? Well, now, is this, is this, <coughs> excuse me, like, like the difference between matter and antimatter, or uh, is it... Uh, no, not really. It, neurons have excitatory properties and, and inhibitory properties. Whenever you learn something new, your neuron is excited and stores that information. If... The, the normal state of the brain should be pretty much neutral. So these excited neurons, mm -hmm. there are inhibitory neurons that go in and say, shut up. Oh. You're, 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 you're blowing our cool. Shut up. <laughs> you're, you're, you're harshing our mellow? <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. Melon. Friend, stop. Uh, but whenever you learn something new, that's why you can't quite retain it because you're, you're, you're trying to get back to that sort of zero point. Well, since this discovery, there have been transcranial uh, um, excitatory uh, electrical stimulus, mm -hmm. this transduction through the cranium that's being used in a lot of therapeutics right now. Um, this was used on human subjects to find out if they could retrieve the lost memory ah. that had been so, sort of told to shut up and go mm -hmm, away. Mm -hmm. They did. Oh, really? Yes. They're, they're considering now this idea of the inhibitory process as an anti-memory coming and trying to, to, they're fighting with the memory. Uh -huh. Neuroscientists truly don't understand how we work. And I firmly believe it's because we go far beyond the physical. Yeah. There is a metaphysical, spiritual aspect to who we are, and much of who we are is probably resident outside what we can perceive. You know, that tracks with um, the research that Chris Putnam pulled together and included in his book, The Supernatural Realm, or mm -hmm. Supernatural Worldview. And he's got a TV show that we're going to be producing exactly. soon on that very topic. Yeah, and, and he discusses the, the uh, just the, the multitude of cases that, that are, you know, that cannot be denied or just wished away yeah. by, by naturalist skeptics yeah. that people, uh, especially those who've suffered near-death experiences perceive things happening around them when they are clinically dead, which means they are able to hear and to see yeah. without the use of their eyes or their ears. That's just as clinically dead isn't yeah. just that your heart stopped. Technically now, I think they're saying you have to have no neural activity. Right, right. And so while the brain is essentially shut down, which means it is not processing any input from the eyes or the ears, 
um, people are able to repeat conversations that took place in their presence when they were clinically dead. Yeah. Or uh, in one case, a woman was able to um, w- was able to say, you know, there's there's a shoe on the window ledge on the tenth floor or or whatever oh. of the building. So it's something, verifiable. Something was verifiable, right? And, and there's a word for this, but they, there there are aspects of their stories that are verifiable. Um, that that they could not information they could not have mm-hmm. possibly known. Yeah. Um, in this case, in the in the case of the woman in Seattle with the uh, the shoe on the window ledge, it was not where she would have been able to see it even when she was awake. But she was brought into the hospital unconscious, having suffered a massive heart attack. So uh, you know, again, if we can perceive, we, if we can hear and we can see when our physical bodies are non-functional. Mm-hmm. You're right. There is more to human consciousness than uh, just than just a, a meat computer. Yeah. In the words of the uh, the skeptics, um, and you're talking about memories and anti-memories. You know, there are things that all of us would like to forget. Forget. Yeah. Well, that's that's that, one that of make... the, the theories is that you can actually help people to forget mm. now that they understand how the inhibitory process be, Because suffering is a bad thing to be avoided at all yeah. costs. Well, no, suffering is, is what makes us part of who we are. And that's what makes Nita Horn's new biography, No Fences, so compelling and so inspiring. And we want to mention this because we've been talking about it for a while and the weeks you know, have, have gone by. It, the book is finally here and it is available for pre-order now. The official release date is April 19th. But in conjunction with the release, um, there's an opportunity for you perhaps to tell your story and to have it told to the world by Defender Publishing. We'll tell you more about that in a second. And uh, Sci Friday continues right after this. To celebrate the release of Nita Horn's inspiring new book, No Fences, Skywatch TV would like you to tell your story because after all, even if you don't think so, you actually have a story. Send in your story and we are going to choose the 10 best and they'll be published for Christmas release in an anthology of those stories, along with the book that you uh, buy that is actually only $19.95, am Mm -hmm. I right on that? That's correct. For free. Tom Horn, crazy guy, he's throwing in a journal which on its own, these most of these retail for $20 on their own. So this journal is to help you start writing your story. Mm -hmm. When you buy the book, not only are you going to be uh, enrolled in this and you can send in your story, but you'll get a plastic pony, you'll Mm -hmm. get a journal of your own, and the proceeds from the book are going to help fund the studio we're building for Skywatch Women. Mm -hmm. And Nita Horn is going to be one of our panel members. The 10 authors who are selected for the anthology published by Defender Publishing in time for Christmas will also receive a $500 cash prize. And that'll go a long way at Christmas time, won't it? (laughs) Yes, it will. Even if your story is not one of those selected for the anthology, if you've taken the time to write your story. You've left a legacy for your children and for your grandchildren. Amen to that. For complete instructions and uh, details on this uh, opportunity, please log on to skywatchtv.com slash no fences. Sci Friday on Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert along with Sharon Gilbert. And uh, the uh, the world in which we live is is the universe in which we live, the multiverse, if you will, is, is yeah. so intriguing and compelling. It is such a magnificent design that uh, we as Christians have nothing to fear from science. But science is actually a wonderful tool to help uh, us better you know, understand. That's why I became a scientist. I love science because it helps me to understand God's creation that much better more. Amen. Uh, however, we are very limited in our ability to comprehend That's right. his amazing creation because as I said, it goes way past the physical. There is a so-called settled science yeah. that's been around for a long time. Hmm. This idea that there's only so much oil mm-hmm. in the ground. Right. Uh, peak oil theory. Peak oil. Which actually first came out about 90 years ago. In the 1920s, uh-huh. there were experts who were warning us that we were going to run out of oil within a decade. Guess what? We've still got some. We've still got some. Well, we still got a lot. <laughs> That's got... why the price of gasoline and, has dropped so much because there's... there's more. There's oil sitting in tankers offshore that won't come into the land because it would be at a loss. Well, get ready for a crazy story because oh, oh, oh. scientists have figured out that they can turn algae into oil. Oh. Yep. So it, perhaps there's an organic origin to hydrocarbons? Well, you'd think so if they can turn uh, 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 algae into oil. 
they, the scientists believe that they have isolated the gene ah. that permits this to take place. And if they can isolate the whole thing that, that encodes for an enzyme that allows this to be created out of thin air, essentially, the plan is eventually to take tobacco plants or something else that grows very quickly because it takes a couple of uh, weeks mm -hmm. for an algae cell, at least the algae that this grows in, uh, to uh, reproduce. This is uh, Botryococcus brownii is the name of the, uh, the algae. And it makes these liquid hydrocarbons that will be grown in tobacco mm -hmm. plants. They are going to use this technology. It's referred to as genome mining is what they're doing. Oh. It allows a closer investigation of interesting, is, I'll come in again, interesting enzymes so that these enzymes can later be used for applications in healthcare or in industry. And of course, these artificial hydrocarbons will probably be everywhere. What I find really interesting about this is there's only so much land to grow plants for food. Yeah. And yet so many scientists now want to take plants to grow not only these hydrocarbon, hydrocarbons, but also to grow pharmaceuticals and mm -hmm. vaccines. Right. This is crazy town. Yeah, yeah. Uh, here in America, of course, we've uh, had an ethanol boom about 10 years ago. Um, well, back it's when bust we were, now. Well, it is bust now, yes. Uh, the uh, U.S. government was subsidizing the mm -hmm. ethanol industry. And uh, we were growing corn, and many, many millions of acres of land were converted over to growing corn, yeah. specifically to convert it into ethanol, and then add it to our gasoline supply so that we could stretch out our gasoline supply. Yeah. And we were growing food to burn it inside our cars. Is yeah. that nuts? It really is nuts. With so many people in the world starving, yeah. we're worried about whether or not we can you know, start up our engines. Yeah. Well, this is, this is interesting, though, because, again, this, this alga that uh, is... <laughs> it's kind of funny the way they put it in the article here. They say that it is, um, uh, what's the word they <laughs> used? <laughs> you know, it's, it's found pretty much everywhere. There's a word that they used here that... Uh, um, Other than omnipresent? Well, yeah, they, they basically found you can grow it Pretty much promiscuous. That was the word. Oh, that, well, no, it's <laughs> the, the enzyme mean, is promiscuous. Ubiquitous means it's found everywhere. Promiscuous yeah. means it works with more than one right. molecule. So. Yeah. So it will produce uh, several different types of uh, yeah. hydrocarbon products, including yeah. again biofuels. Uh, but again, I think the the implication of this though is intriguing. Um, a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to interview Dr. Jerome Corsi, who is a staff writer for WND WorldNet Daily. Uh, he's written a number of really intriguing books, one on the Kennedy assassination. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he wrote about the North American Union back when it was not nice to say so because, you know, conservatives weren't supposed to believe that the Bush administration was trying to, you know, make us part of a yeah. North American, the globalist agenda. But he wrote a book called The Great Oil Conspiracy a few years ago, arguing that oil was the uh, product of an abiotic process, a natural process deep within the earth, which is why wells that were thought to be tapped out decades ago are producing again. Yeah. So here we've got scientists who are showing one process by which this could happen naturally. And so maybe Dr. Corsi wasn't crazy after all. Well, you know, another disturbing part of this is that the, yeah, I've never thought Jerry Corsi no, is crazy. No, no. He's, he's amazing. But another disturbing part of this is that this takes place in fresh water. This algae lives in fresh water. Right. If indeed science figures out a way to speed up the process or to find another algae that can survive and produce the same thing. It runs a risk of possibly poisoning freshwater sources. Uh, now, I don't know if that would happen, but imagine growing oil in your field. Yeah, not, not what you no, want. No, no, now I know that that's, that's being extreme and mm -hmm. <laughs> imagine I would do that. But it, it concerns me that scientists are willing to completely move away from the natural products that, you know, tobacco should be just a plant. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be a small factory. Yeah. And yet it's being turned into a small factory. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, kind of crazy. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Radioactive well, wild... One more. Uh, one more? Oh, yeah. Oh, well, then we have to go to Borzilla. Yes. <laughs> this is... I'm so sorry it, we've run out of time, but at least we could get to Borzilla. Yeah. The Fukushima reactor has left essentially a, a wasteland around it. 
the, the small towns around Fukushima yeah. have been abandoned. No one can live there. The, the radiation levels are still very high, but apparently a species of wild boar is going nuts. It has no problem reproducing yeah. even in that radioactive environment. Boy, scientists are saying that they are well, they're breeding like rabbits. They're, they are taking over. They've increased by 330%. Huh. That is, well, you know, in, in a way, it's, it's we, can, we can see the humor in it, but at the same time, we understand that this is not really a laughing matter. Not at all. It's a real wilding that's taking place yeah. because of the abandonment. And if ever... Uh, people and Japan's a very small area, mm -hmm. so if they want to actually recoup this area and take it back, they're going to ha and they sent hunter in, hunters in yeah. to try to take out the boar. And honestly, it's not the boar's fault. No, no, they're, they're just, just doing what they you know were designed to do. Filling an ecological niche. Yeah, yeah. the uh, po population's increased by three times in the four years since the disaster. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, they've said it's caused uh, <laughs> almost fifteen million dollars worth of damage to crops in the area. Yeah, it's, well, it's terrible. Sci Friday. Uh, we're on Facebook. Make sure you check out our Facebook page. You'll find the uh, link here on the uh, bottom of the screen. I'm not going to try to repeat it because it's long. And uh, you can send us email. Yes. Sci Friday at SkyWatchTV.com. Have a blessed weekend. We'll be back next week. Uh, next week's program on Skywatch TV, the full program, Gary Haven, writer, producer oh, of the new film, Amerigeddon. I, he is so cool. I really enjoyed having him here. He was he's got to come back. Yeah, an important message, too. So have a blessed weekend, and until next time, thank you for watching as we keep watch. For Sharon Gilbert, I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is Skywatch TV. Most American families are just 72 hours away from disaster. Here at Skywatch TV, we hope we can help avoid that. I have been given permission to tell about this massive deal. There's one packet where you get one of each of these, breakfast and entree buckets, and again, 25 years uh, shelf life. With that, you will get 15 of these Wise Fire packets. You'll get one of this water bottle. It will filter 99.9% .9 of the impurities out of your water. Also, you will get for free this awesome auto kit. Now, there's another package. There, there are two more packages. The second package, you get three of each bucket. You pay for those and you get the auto kit free, you get the Wise Fire free, and you get two of these bottles. There's a third deal. You won't believe this one. You get six of each of these. You get the auto kit free. You get the wise fire free. You get two bottles. Guess what else? You get the Mac Daddy. Ooh. 50 gallon water storage container. If the electric grid goes down, one of these is gonna come very handy. Three packages for preparedness. One that feeds a family of six for a month. One that feeds a family of six for three months and one that feeds a family of six for half a year, and of course that includes the 50 gallon water tank. You'll find all of those deals online, the Wise Food Preparedness Specials at skywatchtvstore.com. Well, you've probably talked about this on your uh, your updates already, but just in case you're not aware of it, there is a 3D printed version of the Gate of Baal yes. from uh, Palmyra that right. is being, it really is being constructed in London, and then later on this year, it'll be constructed in New York City. Right. Uh, what I find interesting about those two cities is that they are connected already. They both have the needle of Cleopatra yeah. in them. The, and this was really interesting. I, I had not made this connection, but I, I think this well, is significant. Well, I'm doing a 19th century thing, so, you know, I'm, I've, London's on my brain all the time. Yeah, um, and, and there have been some claims that have made it into the, uh, the Christian media that, that I think are maybe a little bit... Um, Say sensationalist about the about the, okay. but the Temple of Bell. Yeah, the, okay. This is again. This is from the the Temple of Bell, which was built in the first century. Mm -hmm. uh, as we talked about it last week, it yeah. uh, uh, was cre it, it was dedicated in the year thirty two. So just about the time Jesus was going to the cross, mm -hmm. this Temple of Bell or Baal or mm -hmm. Baal 
was, was being dedicated. Yes. And in Jesus' own words, he links Baal to Satan. So we're basically, we're looking at these gates, replicas of the gates that uh, for the going to look at this. It's being peer reviewed right now. It is going to be peer reviewed. Which may or may not mean it will work. It's just whether or not they believe that it does right. not violate the laws of physics. Right, right. Um, yeah, and peer review is, uh, you know, someone who was part of the academic mm -hmm. uh, community. Yes. When we met, you were working at the uh, IU. I was conducting research. And yes, conducting retool at the uh, School of Optometry for and Indiana University. And they let me university. do it. That's what's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, you understand that peer review doesn't necessarily mean that something is actually passed some sort of test that no, that, that it's all, validates the science. It, precisely. It, it, it simply is having people who are trusted in the field look at the paper, make sure, first of all, that you did your due diligence, that the, the numbers add up, this and that. But it doesn't mean that it will work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there, there are some... Uh, horror stories out there, and I, I don't have the numbers in front of me because I didn't think we'd go here, but uh, that showing that, that even peer-reviewed science, um, that a, a fraction, less than half of the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the experiments that, that make it into peer-reviewed journals are actually uh, replicable. <laughs> so I've seen dachshund scientists, though, and their <laughs> stuff always works. Yeah, yeah. or else. <laughs> German engineering. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. I, we, we could talk about a bunch of things. Temple that was destroyed mm -hmm. by the Islamic State last year being c constructed in London and, and in New York. Yeah. And as you point out, these, these uh, needles of Cleopatra. Yeah, Cleopatra's needles, yeah. yeah. They, uh, they are uh, obelisks. Right. Which, of course, represents the uh, the phallus of Osiris. It does, and so you're getting into this idea. If you have a gateway, in many ways, that is the female receptacle, the the uh, the uh, uh, needle, the uh, uh, obelisk. Mm -hmm. Sorry, forgot the forgot the word. Let me come in again. Uh, that represents the male aspect. Right. And so you've got, well, frankly, the Ghostbusters. Uh, a combination. Yes. You've got the key master and the gatekeeper. Exactly. <laughs> and, and these these uh, obelisks were removed from uh, the uh, the Egyptian city of Heliopolis, where they were constructed in 1450 B.C. or thereabouts by the uh, Pharaoh Thutmose the Third. Yeah. Who was considered the greatest conqueror of all of the Egyptian pharaohs? I mean, yeah. Ramses, <laughs> no, Thutmose. He actually waged war as far north as the uh, Euphrates River hmm. uh, and the, the Battle of Kadesh um, against the uh, the and the, the kingdom of Mitanni. Well, you're writing a book about all and, this. And right I'm getting now. into so some of that really stuff. You're really reading right. up on this. This is kind of new to me. But anyway, this was a patching, matching pair, starting with a, the Star Trek reference. There was a. Uh, a, a new engine that uh, NASA has been talking about here for f some months. We mentioned it once or twice on the daily news updates. It's uh, what they're calling the M drive or the EM drive, mm -hmm. which is supposedly a fuel free engine that uh, Electromagnetic the, the, the developers. Drive. Yes. Is that what they're saying? I, I believe so. Um, the, uh, but the idea that this is fuel free almost makes it sound like a perpetual motion machine. You know, like one of those Rube Goldberg type things. That yeah, just... but, but it re no, perpetual motion means that it doesn't require any outside stimulus. This does because it's using solar energy. Well, it's using it? solar energy to create the, uh, the power. Uh, and it, it supposedly, according to the, the designers who've been working on this, creates thrust by bouncing microwaves around inside of a chamber. And they <laughs> claim that it could generate enough power to transport a craft to Mars and in 10 weeks. And cook a turkey on And cook a there. turkey in less than 20 minutes, which is really incredible. So, um, but now many of the uh, scholars have looked at this and engineers have looked at this say that this just cannot possibly work because <laughs> you cannot defy the laws of physics. Um, it supposedly, uh, well, violates the laws of physics, but there are uh, engineers now and scientists who are Speak, friend, and enter. It's time for Science, Science. Sci Friday on Skywatch TV. <laughs> Welcome. I'm Tara Gilbert, and joining us in studio, as always, my best friend and the Skywatch TV science editor, Sharon Gilbert. Hi, honey. Hi, sweetheart. Melon. Yes. That's the, the, the Middle Earth name, the, the Elvish word for a friend. We are total geeks. We truly are <laughs> way too geeky. In fact, your ears are a little bit pointy. They are. Yeah. I, I always thought, you know, that's why I related so well to Mr. Spock on, on Star Trek. Yeah. That's how I learned to do, do this. 
Oh, yeah, the spa yeah. crown. Oh, and of course, you know, this has uh, got uh, actually Jewish significance. It does, and yeah. that's, that actually Nimoy came up with Right, that. right. So, yeah, uh, yeah there's, there's a little backstory to that that most of us don't even, don't even know. We don't know half the things that are going on in the world. We don't even know half the things we talk about on I this program. I don't know who are you again? <laughs> I don't know who I am. Well, welcome again to Sci Friday. You know what? We've got lots of stuff to talk about. We've got the longest list yeah. I think we've ever had. And we'll never get through We'll never it get all. through all of it. No. So let's just dive in and see let's how much do. we can cover. What's the first thing you want to talk about? Well, I thought there was something, as long as we're...